Today, the City Council's Oversight Committee held a meeting with the mayor to discuss the use of no-knock warrants, following the mayor putting a moratorium on the practice after the shooting. So far, no word on if the officer will be charged in this case, Nora. Unlike Chauvin, Potter is expected to testify on her own behalf. Nora. David Schumann, thank you. David Schumann from our Minneapolis station, WCCO, was inside the courtroom when that verdict was read. And you can see this line of law enforcement officers, state troopers, Brooklyn Center police have advanced up to this gas station here on the corner. We're three hours past curfew now. This is a very active standoff right now. We're real close to everything that's going on. I want to show you in front of the Brooklyn Center Police Department are dozens of officers in riot here. He's standing in his doorway with his three children watching this and he is just defeated. He, he says he can't believe he can't believe that this is happening right in front of his home. He said he's not going to be able to go get groceries or gas for his car. They are throwing flashbangs right in our direction. There were people that looked to be gearing up to throw water bottles over the fence onto the freeway at the officers, but there were louder voices telling them, don't do it. But now people are running again. More flashbangs are coming in our direction. And, and you know, what's so scary about this happening is we just talked to a woman who said two... Oh, it came right over our head. Buffalo's police chief stepped to the mic today, and at first he couldn't even get through giving out the basic information of what happened. We heard her mother earlier. She was so upset, and understandably, her daughter was missing for nearly two hours. If you're not vaccinated, the recommendation is still to wear a mask when around others who are also unvaccinated. These cars lined up in the turn lane waiting to pick up their children create a blind spot for kids trying to cross the street. They can't see anyone coming in the left lane. Come on, you didn't really think I was going to throw this ball and embarrass myself, did you? Well, tonight the White House says President Biden is considering restricting the use of no-knock warrants by federal agents. The increasingly controversial tactic gained renewed attention after a Minneapolis police officer shot and killed 22-year-old Amir Locke last week during a no-knock raid on his cousin's apartment. Here's David Schumann of our CBS Minneapolis station, WCCO. It's time to do right or move along. At Minneapolis City Hall today, there were more calls for justice. And enough is enough. We will not stand for it any longer. Hundreds more took to the streets over the weekend, demanding accountability after last week's police shooting of 22-year-old Amir Locke. You know, we're here for them, and this is how we show we're here for them. Locke was shot and killed inside of an apartment just before 7 a.m. last Wednesday as SWAT officers executed a no-knock search warrant. Police body cam shows officers entering the apartment where Locke was asleep on the couch. He can be seen holding a gun as an officer fires three shots, killing him. Locke's name was not on the search warrant. Amir was a gun carrying license in the visual. In November 2020, Minneapolis implemented new restrictions on no-knock warrants. The Minneapolis police performed a total of 171 raids that year. In the year following, they executed only 78. So far this year, the MPD has served at least 11 no-knock warrants. The officer who fired the shots has since been placed on administrative leave. Locke's parents are left with bitter grief. We believe that he executed them. Our son, Amir. I should be able to tell my son that I love you and he says I love you too. That's right. But now I have to do that in spirit. Today, the city council's oversight committee held a meeting with the mayor to discuss the use of no-knock warrants, following the mayor putting a moratorium on the practice after the shooting. So far, no word on if the officer will be charged in this case, Nora. David Schumann, thanks. Some families that live in this apartment building, and you can see that we're right across the street from the police department behind all of these protesters. These families have resorted to putting wet towels in the windows to keep tear gas out. It hasn't worked, and the safety and mental health of the children who live here is at stake. There's nothing we could do. Johnny Tolliver has been acting as security for his apartment building, making sure no looters or protesters pass through the front door. We are literally on ground zero and we're, and we're scared up in here. We don't know what to do, who to call? Because the police is doing all this and the riders are doing all this, who can we call? His neighbor, Jemiah Creighton, takes care of her 11-year-old sisters and has a three-year-old daughter of her own. We're not comfortable in our own house. 
we are coughing all the time. Um, no peace, loud noise, all day, every day. These kids are gonna be traumatized because of what they are seeing and what they hear. They hear these flash bangs all night long. Who's making the call on using tear gas? Mayor Mike Elliott says the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office was in charge of Tuesday night's operation. Gassing, in my opinion, is not in a humane way of, of policing. Brooklyn Center has banned the practice, but Elliott conceded Tuesday the sheriff is ignoring him on the subject. A spokesperson for the sheriff's office told WCCO decisions to use tear gas are made case by case in an effort to ensure the safety of the protesters and police officers. He couldn't say for sure if it will be used Wednesday. Mayor Elliott said the city is working with community organizations to offer relief to the people who live here. In Brooklyn Center, David Schumann, WCCO 4 News. To see the two fathers of these two little children embrace each other outside the hospital where their kids are fighting for their lives, it was a powerful moment, hard to put into words, but it was emblematic of what so many people in Minneapolis feel right now, which is that enough is enough and the violence has to stop. Right Rayshawn Smith right looked there. to the window of his baby girl's hospital room. She's fighting. Yeah. She feels all of you here. He spoke to a crowded vigil held nightly here for nine-year-old Trinity Smith, who was shot in the head this weekend in Minneapolis. I prayed for that little girl, and I got her. I got her. I can't lose her. I can't lose her. I can't lose her. I can't lose her. I can't. Trinity's room is next door to LaDavion Garrett Jr.'s room, a 10-year-old also shot in the head in Minneapolis last month. This vigil is for him, too, and his dad, LaDavion, came together with Rayshon to applause. I just got on my knees. I ain't never prayed this much. And look at my son now. That's all he need. We go we get through this. We got God. That's it. Earlier in the day Monday, LaDavion's grandmother, Shari Jennings, brought the fury at a press conference about community safety. There's two kids at North Memorial right now fighting for their life from a gunshot wound to the head. When is North Minneapolis going to stand up? When is enough enough? She didn't mince words in telling Mayor Jacob Fry and Police Chief Madera Arredondo their plan to stop gun violence needs to bring results. I hope y'all step up because if not, this is going to be a deadly summer. This is going to be a deadly summer of kids, of kids. Our kids ain't safe now. Fry said 19 kids have been shot this year in the city. Trinity and LaDavion have the support of this community, and every thought and prayer is needed. I just love her. I want her to be okay. I want her to come home. Mayor Fry's safety plan is to have law enforcement and community-driven approaches working simultaneously. Hi. Good, how are you? This is the first time I feel like I, it's okay to hug you since March of last year. During the pandemic, it's always been six feet apart and outdoors for Rob and Paula Engelking. The brother and sister are two weeks past getting their completed vaccinations, which now in accordance with new CDC guidelines, opens up a lot of opportunity for them. As far I can as I come know, over right? to your house and you can come over to mine. Uh, Mason, I'm coming in and I might even good. hug you, <laughs> whether you like it or not. <laughs> Rob and Paula are both essential caregivers for their parents who live in a Woodbury retirement community. The couple hasn't been able to regularly see each other even after being vaccinated. What this updated guidance means for them and others who live in long-term care facilities is still unclear. I'd well, give it, it all is. up if, if my mom and dad could just start having lunch and supper together, because that's, that's what I want. They want them to get to hang out together. The Minnesota Department of Health says it takes its guidance for nursing homes from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. It's waiting to hear for possible updates on long-term care visitation. We'll work to update information for Minnesotans as appropriate over the coming days. The Angle Kings hope for some good news on that front soon. For now, they're savoring this bit of progress toward a post-pandemic world. I'm safe and, I, and I'm not a threat to other people. I know there's still some possibility, but... I, you do. You feel like you won the lottery. David Schumann, WCCO 4 News. You can't talk about Fargo, let alone celebrate it, without bringing up the accents. And they turned it up to 11. Yeah, yeah. they did. They went just, just, just past. They wanted to kind of highlight it. 
I remember seeing the film and I thought, oh, I should have done it so much more. That's Michelle Hutchison. She grew up in Minnesota and playing the escort opposite oh. Steve Buscemi was her first film role. Michelle joined our little Fargo reunion it's along with business. Tony Denman, who played young Scotty Lundegaard. Even as a 40-year-old man, I'm still the kid from Fargo. <laughs> and Larissa Kokerno, who was in one scene. I didn't grow up talking like a Minnesotan, but gosh, I can get into it any second. I spoke to them on the roof of the downtown Minneapolis club parking garage, the same place a Buscemi shootout scene was filmed. Joel and Ethan Cohen, who wrote and directed Fargo, are from St. Louis Park and used several Twin Cities locations in the movie. There's a shot of the Lakeside Club in Matamidai. An attendant in the movie is killed in a booth at the Center Village parking ramp in downtown Minneapolis. Yet another local location. This room right here, number seven at the Hitching Post Motel in Forest Lake, is where William H. Macy's character was arrested at the end of the movie. The motel is still open today. He's like, yeah, this was like in that movie Far the, or Fargo or something. I was like, really? In fact, Wyzetta, Chaska, White Bear Lake, Stillwater, Edina, and Eden Prairie are all mentioned in the movie. Local author Todd Melby decided to take all this and write a book about it. A lot can happen in the middle of nowhere, the untold story of the making of Fargo. I asked Todd what he thinks makes the movie such an enduring classic around here. It held up a mirror to us, like this is the way we are, and it also showed the rest of the world how we are. Now, lots of Minnesotans didn't like that, but you know, it's pretty much true as far as the puffy hats and the funny accent goes. Fargo has followed Tony, Larissa, and Michelle around for 25 years and will continue to do so. Something, you know, they're pretty proud of. I'm happy to embrace it because there's, you know, we were just kind of saying that like, how, how could you ever be in a better film? David Schumann. Oh yeah. WCCO 4 News.